Hi everybody. I'm thinking that the 21st century has bred, at least in the United States and probably also in Europe, the kind of a person who is a what's next, short attention span, hurry, 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 let's get on with it type of person. Somebody once described this as people belonging to the cult of the next thing, with ever decreasing room for actual relationships. But now with COVID restrictions, it's as if life is forcing us to stop and just be. Restrictions on hospital visits, the workplace, travel, person-to-person -person interaction, and restrictions on our ability to hurry. As one of our uh, world's most respected teachers on the spiritual life once said, when he was asked, what's the one most important thing I can do to cultivate my relationship with God? He said this, ruthlessly eliminate hurry in your life. Ruthlessly eliminate hurry in your life. So in some ways, at least, COVID is helping us with that. And it feels to me like there is a growing hunger for real relationship, real person-to-person -person contact. Over the last decade, social media, probably especially Facebook, has separated us from each other. Facebook, on Facebook, you can have hundreds of friends, but no real friends. You can be connecting on media more than ever, but be lonelier than ever. And it feels like God wants us to use this time to awaken us to the need for human interaction, actual people actually looking at each other, actually listening to what the other person has to say, actually into the other person's life. And more and more, I hear that Zoom just isn't doing it. So what is it that the Holy Spirit might be saying to us and to you right now uh, through our current circumstances? So last week, we were in Acts chapter 7. We left the Apostle Paul in Athens, where he had crafted a brilliant speech. He was a trained debater, and he was feeling fully ready for this task of coming to the intellectuals in Athens and teaching them how Jesus Christ makes total sense in their world. Because by now, uh, this time, Paul had stayed on the move, going city to city, taking voyages, walking all kinds of places, being chased out of synagogues, out of cities, and left, even stoned and left for dead. Now he's at the intellectual center of the world, and he feels ready for this task. But he left Athens, having thought he could reason with the best of them. And in verse 34 of chapter 17, we see the results of his visit to Athens. It reads, Some of the people believed and became followers of Paul. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, and also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. So I don't want you to miss this, uh, that we had already met a woman leader in Philippi. Now there is a woman getting a prominent uh, mentioned in Athens, and in that society, especially Jewish culture, the women were the lowest in, of all the democratic, uh, democratic, demographic groups. Um, but as we see the New Testament progress, we see God radically elevating the status and role of, role of women. In fact, the first person to announce the gospel of Jesus Christ to the disciples was a woman named Mary. Now, in all the cities prior to Athens, Paul's preaching had stirred things up. And the word used to describe new believers was not some, but rather many or a large number. And now Paul comes from Athens to Corinth, having experienced people listening to him in Athens and just shrugging their shoulders. After hearing the earth-shattering news of the resurrection and, and lordship and forgiveness of sins of Jesus Christ, and Paul must have been so discouraged. He had been led to the, by the Holy Spirit. He had been totally faithful to the gospel. He had been trained and taught by the disciples of Jesus. And now his evangelism is simply not working. So here he is, humbled in Corinth, 
humbled at the fact that his brilliant convincing uh, of people didn't work. Now what? I want you to notice something in a letter that Paul wrote back to the Corinthians um, after having left Corinth. And he wrote this. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed to destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the power of God. As the scriptures say, where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, the world's brilliant debaters? God has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe even when others call it nonsense. He's referring to the Athenians. And he's saying that God has humbled him and brought him back to the simple message of the gospel that so many people consider foolish. But that's what works. Here in Corinth, a synagogue leader, of all things, became a believer after he had returned to the humble, simple message of Jesus. And many Corinthians became believers. And it was at this point, Paul, having been humbled before God, that the Holy Spirit appears to have made a course correction in Paul's life. Back in Acts 16, the Holy Spirit had driven him, had led him out of Asia and into Europe. Keep moving, Paul. Things to do, places to go, people to reach. But now, the time, this time, the Holy Spirit, personally, no intermediary like last time, says to Paul, stay put. Here's Acts 18.9. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, Don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack or harm you. For many people in this city belong to me. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half, teaching the word of God. It looks like Paul was now humbled enough to move on from evangelism uh, and speeches and evangelistic speeches and teachings to now be something different, to be the pastor a church needed, to do the slow, messy work of just being in relationship with people and helping them grow into the salvation that God has for them, to actually himself be the one to stay and nurture the growth of a church that he had started, rather than start and then just leave. And Corinth was as messy a church as they come. Now there are three messages in God in what God said. Don't be afraid. Yes, Paul, you may be a starter. Uh, you're a what's next type of person, but I want you to stay and do something that's out of your comfort zone, but I'll be with you. Then he said, no one will attack or harm you. I'll protect you. And number three, there are many, Paul, Paul, right in this city who need you, who need you, Paul, to be with them. So stay. So I wonder about you and me. Is there a place where God wants you to stay put? Maybe you're just tired of getting beat up. The same old thing, getting no results. Maybe you're a starter, not a maintainer. And it's easier to just move on to break camp, go for greener pastures. And God is saying to you, stay put. The people right where you are need you. And maybe it's really discouraging to stay put because you're feeling ineffective. But maybe, just maybe, your tiredness, your discouragement might be the humbling that you need to finally give up, give in, and let God do with you where you are what he wants to do, to be your strength instead of your strength being all your all of your can-do efforts. And there's a lot that we know about staying put. We know that churches work best when pastors stay put. We know that churches work best when church members uh, are in it for the long haul. We know that marriages work best when father and mother stay together through thick and thin, determined to make it work. We know that friendships happen when people stick it out with each other. And in the book of Acts, there are 51 times when the words one another are used together. So, after 18 months in this seaport town of all kinds of messiness, what were the results of Paul's having stayed? Well, they're numerous. 
Uh, he wrote two letters, First and Second Corinthians. Actually, it's more. It's two, three or four letters combined. Uh, and there's so much teaching in those letters. Uh, Corinth was a place where everything that can go wrong does go wrong. Arguments, factions, sexual improprieties, discrimination, rudeness, stupidity, etc. But nearly everything that can go right does go right. Forgiveness, entering into each other's lives, baptism, uh, reconciliation, reckless generosity, um, community. And we learn so much from those letters from Paul having stayed and worked with the people. And through it all, something solid was growing because he stayed. And it was there uh, that he stayed with God's chosen people and God himself. And he also met there his business partners, partners, new partners uh, named Priscilla and Aquila. And notice that her name is first. And I think this is very interesting. Uh, I love how William Barclay puts this in his commentary. Priscilla may have been upper class in Rome, and Aquila may have been a lower class Jew, and they met in this church in Rome in about 40 AD, and maybe like in the South Pacific, somewhere across a crowded room, there will be a stranger, a stranger, and uh, you'll meet each other, and it'll be magic. Maybe they met each other in church. And then in 44, Jews were expelled from Rome, and and, and Aquila had to leave, but not Priscilla, because she was a, a, a non-Jew. But she chose to follow Christ and follow Aquila, and they went off to uh, Corinth. And it's a romantic story. Is that not a cool story, if, if it happened that way? So um, anyway, they end up setting up camp as te tent makers in Corinth. And they had this year and a half that they spent with the uh, Apostle Paul. And then, after the year and a half, they traveled with Paul to Ephesus. And Paul leaves Priscilla and Aquila behind in Ephesus while Paul goes back to all those other churches he had started. So they're alone there. And along comes a man who was trained in Alexandria, the other great intellectual capital of the uh, Roman Empire. And he had somehow become a believer. He ends up in Ephesus, and he's there with Priscilla and Aquila, and Priscilla and Aquila train him in the, uh, here it is in verse 26, when Priscilla and Aquila heard Apollos, that's his name is Apollos, he comes from Alexandria, Priscilla and Aquila meet him, and they explained to him the way of God more adequately. Well, Apollos is my vote for the author of Hebrews, and Priscilla and Aquila are my vote for his best tutors in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you see this? Priscilla, a woman named first, right there uh, in the founding of the Christian church, which has lasted over 2,000 years. All of this because Paul stayed put in Corinth in relationship with God, in relationship with the people, and in deep relationship with and investing in the most powerful husband-wife team in the New Testament. So, Paul did, after his journey all over the place and after Apollos, leaves for Corinth, and he finds a group of people in the city of Ephesus, and he asks this group of believers... Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? That's uh, in, in uh, the beginning of chapter 19. It turns out they had received the baptism of repentance of John the Baptist, which is a little bit like um, a transactional kind of thing. Um, get baptized, you repent of your sins, and now you begin to obey the law and follow Jesus with to the best of your ability but now there's new information there's not just repentance but there is actual baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Paul placed his hands on them the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied there is a very interesting way to read this 
building on Ezekiel 36 and building on Jeremiah, where those prophets had said one day, the Spirit of God will not just be directing you from outside of yourselves, but from within. God will live in you, you will live in God, and you will be moved, not through teeth-gritting obedience, but by the Spirit of God, through a relationship with God, to uh, follow God. In other words, the Spirit will be within you and move you. Jesus will stay put in you as you stay put in Him. That's how relationships happen, by remaining, by staying. Jesus talked about that in, in John chapter 15. And that's how the power of the gospel takes hold. What happens now? The Holy Spirit once again leads Paul to stay put. Just as he kind of said to these believers, I want you to stay put with Jesus, and so Jesus will stay put with you, and that's how you grow. I, the God now leads Paul to stay put in Ephesus for two years. And uh, yes, there was opposition, opposition. There was at least one huge riot. It's probable that he was imprisoned there. Uh, but what happened when he stayed put? Miracles. I hope you take time in uh, chapter 19 of Acts to read about this. It's fascinating. And Paul's education in God's training room continued, leading him years later to write this. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So I'm now glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. Staying put is God's training room in Christ-like humility. And that's precisely where the power often is. So where might God be leading you to stay put? Is he perhaps leading you to stay put in marriage? Because staying put in marriage grows us up. I can't think of anything more that more valuable and effective in growing us up when we live in a Christ-like marriage and stick with it to the end. Uh, maybe God is leading you to stick with a church that needs you. Maybe as parents, God is leading you to stay committed to your children, no matter what age they are, teaching you to never, never, never give up on them. Because in that way, especially when your children are for a long time uh, very challenging, in that way, you learn the heart of God and his commitment and his love for his children, including you and me. Maybe God is leading you to stay put with a servant's attitude and hard work in a job where there's no appreciation, low pay, and it's that which will teach you more as an apprentice of Jesus than a job with all the comforts. Or perhaps God is asking you to stay in a difficult, seemingly impossible relationship or friendship. It's that that will train you in Christ-likeness much more than just moving on to the next person, which leaves you weakened for the next challenge that comes your way. Paul stayed put in Corinth for a year and a half. And it's from Corinth and the letters to the Corinthians that we learn about what it means to grow up in so many facets of our lives. Paul stayed put in Ephesus for, Ephesus for two years. And it's from Ephesus and his letter to the Ephesians, that we learn the definition of maturity, which is where he writes this, bearing with one another in love. We become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That doesn't come moving from place to place when uh, things get tough. And so, um, how might God be leading you by his Holy Spirit today? 
Maybe it's not to move on. And maybe it's not that next thing. Maybe what God has for you is right where you are. God bless everybody.